Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome virtually to Old Dominion University and its remote experience for young engineers and scientists program known as Reyes. My name is Giovanna Gennard, Assistant VP for Strategic Communication and Marketing and co-chair of Reyes. And I will serve as your host for today's event, featuring a trailblazing leader, astronaut Ellen Ochoa, who made history as the first Latina to travel to space and to direct NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. At this webinar, we have more than 475 participants from around the globe. And we're also streaming the webinar live on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you all for joining us. Throughout the webinar, you may submit questions through the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. And following Dr. Ochoa's lecture, we will answer as many of your questions as time allows. The purpose of the Global Reyes program is to inspire future scientists, engineers, and high-tech entrepreneurs. And today, we have the honor to hear from a STEM champion who is opening so many doors for future generations of STEM-minded students. Old Dominion is a diverse and inclusive university that produces the second largest percentage of STEM age graduates in Virginia. We have a long history in aerospace. Last year, a woman-led team of ODU students made history in Virginia when they launched the first student-built spacecraft into space through a collaboration with the Virginia Space Grant Consortium. And just last month, ODU alumnus John Lean received NASA's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal, placing him in the ranks of past winners like Neil Armstrong, John Glenn, and Buzz Aldrin. Today's virtual visit with Dr. Ochoa is a tremendous opportunity to gain insights into the STEM career that launched her into space and to inspire many, many students around the globe to follow in her footsteps and reach for the stars. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Bowles, the Executive Director of the Virginia Institute for Space Flight and Autonomy at Old Dominion University and retired Director of the NASA Langley Research Center, who will introduce our distinguished speaker, his colleague and friend, Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Bowles. Well, good afternoon and thanks, Giovanna. Uh, we have a tremendous speaker this afternoon and it's my pleasure to introduce her, Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Ellen was the uh, director of NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas from 2013 until her retirement in May, 2018. And as Giovanna uh, mentioned, was also the first Latina in space and the first Hispanic director of the uh, center. She, has, uh, she flew on a nine day mission aboard the shuttle Discovery in 1993. She has flown to space four times, logging nearly a thousand hours. She currently serves on several boards, including chair of the National Science Board. Prior to her astronaut career, Dr. Ochoa was a research engineer and holds three patents for optical systems. She received a BS in physics from San Diego uh, State University and both an MS and a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. She is also honored to have six schools named after her and has been recognized with NASA's Distinguished Service Medal, the Women in Aerospace Outstanding Achievement Award, the Hispanic Engineer Albert Baez Award for Outstanding Technical Contributions to Society, and the Hispanic Heritage Leadership Award. She has also been inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame and the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. As G Giovanna said, I had the great fortune of being a colleague of Ellen's when we were both center directors, and our two centers worked on several projects together. One of these was Orion, which will serve as the exploration vehicle that will carry astronauts to space, provide emergency abort capability, sustain them during their missions, and provide safe reentry from deep space return. And this is the vehicle that will enable the first woman and the next man to land on the moon and then on to deep space and ultimately Mars. She was always a pleasure to work with, always putting the missions and the people working on those missions as her first priority. I'm also honored to call her my friend. And with that, I give you Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dave. You certainly brought back some good memories for me of, of our time working together at NASA. And I'd like to thank Old Dominion University for inviting me to be part of their Reyes program. And for the students who are listening, 
I can tell you, I had no idea when I was in middle school, high school, or even college that I would be able to have such an amazing and rewarding career. And I couldn't have imagined the opportunities that I would have in the STEM fields. Near the end of my 30 years at NASA, when I was the Johnson Space Center Center Director, I remember one of our astronauts um, who had returned from a six month stay on the International Space Station, talking about living and working on the frontier. And that to me was a phrase that really captured the excitement and challenge of human space exploration. A frontier is sometimes an actual place where explorers come and pioneers settle. And it always in some way represents the limits of knowledge or achievement in a particular field where boundaries are pushed. I was fortunate to have an amazing career with NASA, living and working on the frontier, sometimes metaphorically, uh, in demonstrating new capabilities in spacecraft, in performing research and development in space, as the first Latina in space, and as the first Hispanic and second female center director of Johnson Space Center. My career was shaped by the major human spaceflight programs over the last 40 years. I entered graduate school the same year the space shuttle flew for the first time, an event that got me excited about pursuing research in space as a career and eventually led to my first two shuttle missions dedicated to research. And then as we moved into the International Space Station era, I flew on two more missions that were part of the assembly of the space station and worked on the ground to determine how astronauts would train for and operate an International Space Station which we refer to as ISS. And my leadership role as director of Johnson Space Center focused on expanding human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and uh, working with new partners in order to utilize the ISS as a technology test bed and to build capabilities needed for deep space destinations, including the moon and Mars. I think it was really my family's focus on education that was a, a key to my career. Uh, my dad's parents emigrated from Mexico, first to Arizona and then to Southern California where my dad was born as the youngest of 12. He was able to attend college tuition free by getting an appointment to the Naval Academy. Uh, my mom wasn't able to attend college when she was younger um, but she was always interested in learning. And when she was raising my four brothers and sisters and me, um, she started taking one college class a semester at our local university, San Diego State University. And so I always remember hearing about her classes, I saw her do homework. Um, and for a long time, she was just taking classes that she was interested in. And she was interested in many different things. And that certainly made an impression on us. Um, when I was in high school, um, I was interested in music. I played the flute. I was in the band in the California All-State Honor Band. Um, I liked my literature classes. I liked my math classes, took quite a bit. Uh, but I didn't take much science, um, only biology, which I had to take to graduate. And for some reason, I had just decided I wasn't interested in science and it really didn't have anything to do with my future. So I went off to college, um, actually stayed at home, um, went to our local university, San Diego State, um, really not knowing exactly what I wanted to pursue and uh, thought about music, thought about business, um, took a variety of different classes, you know, but I didn't know any scientists or engineers. And even though uh, I did really well in math, um, it didn't occur to me for a long time that that was the basis for a, a lot of uh, STEM careers. Um, but as I was finishing up the calculus series, uh, I did think I should look into subjects that actually used the math that I had been learning. So I went off and talked to a couple of different professors. One was in the electrical engineering department and he was clearly not interested in having me in his department. He, um, he said, well, we had a woman come through here once, but you know, it's a really difficult course of study. And, I just don't know that you'd be interested in what we do, which was kind of ironic given that I had set up the appointment to talk to him to find out more about engineering. Uh, but fortunately, I got a much different reception when I talked to the physics professor who was happy to hear I was interested in physics 
He told me about different uh, ways we could go, different ways you could go, different careers you could have if you studied physics, which was really important to me because I actually didn't know anything about physics and really couldn't picture what it would mean for a career to major in that. And then he asked about my math background. And when he found out that I was finishing up the calculus series, he said, well, that's fantastic. You already know the language of physics. And if you started into the physics series next semester, you really be able to concentrate on the concepts, whereas most people would be taking those simultaneously. And I think you do really well. So um, maybe not surprisingly, after those two conversations, um, I did start into the physics series, ended up majoring in physics, minoring in math. And uh, also uh, another important event was um, there was a weekend where uh, a women in science and engineering conference was held and a number of women scientists and engineers um, came to talk about their careers. And that was also really important to me because I still just really had a hard time picturing what is it that you actually do every day, you know, if you're a scientist or engineer. And, um, and that really gave me some insight that, uh, that I think I needed to, to continue to pursue it. I also had a couple of summer research jobs and that's what really led me to graduate school because I, I got interested in doing research and I wanted to pursue it. And that really required an advanced degree. So um, from a senior project I did as a physics undergrad uh, where I had done some research in optical information processing, um, I ended up going to Stanford for graduate school and in particular to work for a professor there who was um, at the top in his field in Fourier optics. And uh, during my first year there, as I was getting my master's near the end of that uh, first year is when the space shuttle flew for the first time. And of course that was a very different kind of spacecraft than had ever flown before. And uh, even at the beginning, they were talking about all the different things you could use it for. You could um, deploy satellites, retrieve satellites, help repair them. Uh, you could build uh, other things in space. And of course, uh, one of the major roles was to do research in space. And you could actually um, put an entire laboratory inside the payload bay. And uh, since I was headed on a research career, it, it just really caught my eye, the idea of being able to participate both in human space exploration and to do research that you could not do on Earth, that you could only do in the uh, environment of low Earth orbit. A couple years after that first flight, Sally Ride flew. That was a huge deal. Um, first American woman in space. Uh, and uh, she'd been a physics major too. And she had gotten her degrees from Stanford, which is where I was currently studying. Uh, so, you know, all of those connections really helped me think about maybe this was something I could do. And then I think a year after she flew is when Franklin Chang Diaz flew. So the first NASA astronaut um, of Hispanic heritage, he was uh, originally born in Costa Rica. So, um, you know, the astronaut corps was changing, what they were doing was changing, and that really um, made me think about wanting to apply. And I decided to do it as soon as I finished up my PhD. And I was fortunate to have great um, PhD advisors. I had a a primary advisor and a, and a secondary advisor, and they were both really supportive, which I'm, to this day, I'm in contact with them and, and stay in touch. And um, I've talked to many other women and many other people of Hispanic background who did not have um, as good experiences, um, and often because their advisors weren't as supportive, or perhaps they, they listened a little bit too much to um, that earlier a doubly professor that I was talking about. So I, I often tell folks that, you know, the people who have discouraged me at various points were generally people that didn't know me at all. You know, they maybe just saw me and I didn't really fit their picture of what a scientist or engineer looks like. But the people who had a chance to get to know me, my professors or people I worked with or people I worked for, um, could see that I, I brought the things to STEM that really matter. You know, hard work, um, you know, an interest or a passion in, in what you're doing, um, a desire to be part of the team and, and reach those goals. Um, and, uh, and they have, uh, 
those folks have supported me throughout my career. So once I got my PhD, I did send in my application for the astronaut corps, um, but really never expected to hear back from NASA because um, it, they have uh, so many people who apply. And um, also they only do a selection every few years, um, just depending on when they need new astronauts. And they, they weren't doing a selection that year. So I went off to, uh, as a research staff member to take a job at Sandia National Labs, the Department of Energy Lab. Um, in the particular building where I was, there was a group of about 60 PhD researchers. Um, I was the only woman uh, in that group at that time. Uh, but I had the opportunity to, uh, I, I worked primarily with a couple of other folks. Um, we, you know, wrote, uh, did research, wrote papers, presented at conferences, actually got a couple of patents out of the work there, as well as one um, for my PhD work. And uh, after I'd been there about two years, I had the opportunity to interview for the uh, astronaut program. So it was my first visit to Johnson Space Center and my first chance to actually talk to astronauts, find out a little bit more about what the, what the job was really like. Uh, and I wasn't selected that year, but, um, but I did learn a lot more about the job. I became even more excited about it and realized there were a few things that I could do that maybe would make me better qualified. Um, one is that I really didn't have any operational experience. So I went off and, and got a pilot's license. And then I decided I wanted to work for NASA, even if I was never selected as an astronaut. I just, I liked their mission, um, wanted to somehow be part of, you know, expanding scientific knowledge and, and space exploration. So I took a job at NASA Ames Research Center in California. Uh, where I continued to do research and then also became a supervisor of a research group. Well, three years after the first uh, selection where I wasn't selected, uh, NASA did another one. And that was the year I was selected along with uh, 22 other people. And we became the 13th class of astronauts. So our, the first year we actually all trained together as a group. And um, some of that training was really familiar to me, having spent 10 years in college, you know, reading workbooks, a whole stack of them would be all electronic now, but uh, we were actually um, physically working from books, um, learning about the shuttle systems, um, starting to work in um, uh, cockpits that looked like the shuttle, but uh, really just one system at a time at that point. Um, and then there was an, a whole nother kind of training that really wasn't very familiar to me, um, learning how to fly in high performance aircraft and then how to bail out of that aircraft um, and uh, use a parachute, land in, on either land or in water, get picked up by a Coast Guard heli helicopter, um, get a scuba certification because the training for spacewalks happens um, at a big underwater pool at Johnson Space Center. So, um, you know, I hadn't even been a Girl Scout, so a lot of this was pretty new to me. Um, but we had excellent trainers and also got a lot of helpful tips from my classmates. So uh, got through that training, spent another year in partial training and partial jobs supporting the space shuttle program. And, and at the end of my second year, I was assigned to a space shuttle mission. And about a year later is when I got to launch into space uh, for the first time. And that mission and my second mission, which was just a year and a half later, were both part of the same program. It was a program NASA had at that time called Mission to Planet Earth. And we had a set of instruments in the payload bay that were studying the Earth's atmosphere and um, the amount of light coming from the sun, um, specifically to understand the issue of the ozone depletion and ozone hole and the different effects from human activities um, versus changes in the amount of solar radiation. So it was really kind of just exactly what I had thought about um, several years earlier when I, when I first thought of applying the idea of getting to be involved in research that you could not do on earth um, and taking advantage of being above the earth's atmosphere to get data um, that would be uh, helpful for scientists. And I remember talking to one of the principal investigators when I returned and just saying, is there anything else that, um, you know, astronauts can do to help, help, you know, while we're in space? And he said, well, you could stay up longer. 
um, our, that, those flights had been um, nine or 10 days and 11 days. And um, so it, it was interesting because at that time, um, just about a year before NASA had joined up with the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, um, to develop the International Space Station. And a good part of the rest of my career was really focused on the International Space Station. And uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a background on it, you know, it's a human outpost in space. Uh, it orbits about 250 miles above the Earth. It's dedicated to the international exploration of space and research that benefits humanity here on Earth. Um, it has about a million pounds of hardware and um, all of this hardware was built and financed and launched by an international partnership of 15 countries that represented five space agencies. So NASA and Roscosmos, and then also the European, Canadian and Japanese space agencies. And uh, it took over a hundred space flights of different types of launch vehicles to ferry all these parts to orbit and uh, and then multinational crews working with robotic arms assembled everything really piece by piece um, during more than 160 spacewalks. And I was fortunate to be a crew member on two of those assembly missions, including the first uh, space shuttle mission to dock with the ISS when it was just two modules totaling about 40 feet and before it could actually support a crew. And then three years later, I got to go back on a mission that would bring up the first piece of a truss structure, which forms the unpressurized backbone, which is now um, 350 feet long. But as I mentioned, this was the very first piece. So what I'd like to do now is, um, if you can show the video, uh, I'm gonna narrate a video for, uh, for you from that flight where we brought up this uh, piece of truss structure. And that'll give you a little bit better idea of what it's like to be in space. And, um, and then the last part of the video actually shows what ISS is like today. And I'd like to talk about that as well. So uh, this was back in 2002 and that's the uh, spatial Atlantis on the pad at Kennedy Space Center. And this is my crew. We had a crew of seven um, walking out to get out to the launch pad. Here's the uh, main engines, which are firing up. They use liquid fuel. And once they're up at 100%, the solid rockets light off. And that's when you actually leave the launch pad with about 7 million pounds of thrust. And those solid rockets uh, run pretty uh, rough. So you can see some of the vibration here. I'm kind of the center one in that cockpit there um, with the commander and pilot in the, in the front seat. And I, I was operating as the flight engineer. So one of the first things we do is get into the proper orientation so that we can rendezvous with the space station, which orbits the earth at an angle of 51.6 degrees um, compared to uh, the equator. So as I mentioned, both the solids and the liquid engines are operating at the initial part of launch, uh, but the solid rockets, the, those two white rockets, uh, use up all their fuel in the first two minutes. And then the rest of the, uh, the next six and a half minutes, we operate on liquid fuel. And then we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, which is the speed we need to stay in orbit. And over the next uh, day and a half or so, we do a series of burns, which gets us closer to the International Space Station and in a position where we can actually rendezvous and dock with it. And again, here I am working with the commander and pilot, um, the three of us working on all the dynamic phases of flight together. So here's what we look like as we're coming up to the station. And you can see that piece of truss structure, we called it S0 in our payload bay. And then this is what the station looked like as we were getting ready to dock in that big silver ball in the bay is where we're gonna attach. So right before attachment, this is what it looks like as we're looking out the aft flight deck window of the shuttle. That's the station coming into view. Um, and uh, there's uh, the station, the pressurized mating adapter on the top. And then the bottom part is a structure coming up from the shuttle that allows us to connect. Here's our commander, Mike Bloomfield. <laughs> he was pretty happy with his flying. And then after we did a leak check, uh, we opened the hatches and that's the commander of the space station, uh, cosmonaut Yuri Franco. 
Uh, there were two other uh, members of the crew on the station and they were members of my astronaut class. So it was really fun to see them. They've been on orbit for four months. So I think they were happy to see some new faces. And, uh, and then we got right to work. We always transfer supplies and you can transfer not only in your hands, but between your knees as you're floating between the um, shuttle and the space station. But the next morning is when the major part of the work started. I was operating the station's robot arm, which you see in the upper left, and it's lifting S0 up out of the shuttle payload bay. And uh, here's another view. And we spent, um, time that morning uh, moving it into place. This is the robotic workstation. Um, you may notice there's no uh, windows, so we can't actually look outside and see the arm at all. And we tried to use camera views as well as simulated views to make sure we knew what we were seeing. And it's probably just as well that we didn't get distracted by the view here. You can see the Nile River and the Gulf of Aqaba behind the, the S0 truss. And here it is as we're moving it into place on uh, the zenith part of the space station. Um, there's the, uh, uh, on the right, the C-shaped claw is gonna close around a rod and that will perform the first attachment. And there I am with Dan Bursch again. Um, he and I were the two arm operators for this. He was actually at the controls when we made the connection. So we were docked for a week to the space station. And during that time, um, after this initial attachment, we did a series of four spacewalks, all of them aided by the robotic arm, in order to um, complete sort of the assembly and then the power up of the, this piece of truss structure. And so these views right here are from, from the cameras that are on the helmet of the uh, space walking crew members. So you can see them looking down at their hands. Here he's holding a, a cable tray, which would weigh about 200 pounds on earth, but of course is weightless up there. Um, they made all kinds of cable connections to be able to provide power to all the equipment on the truss and also allowing us to send commands and receive data back from all the equipment. And uh, uh, attaching bolts that really completed the structural attachment of S0. This is a view, there's an astronaut at the end of the arm holding a, a structure that looks like a V, um, just giving a little bit different perspective of the Earth um, behind the astronaut. And finally, at the end of the spacewalk, this is what it looks like. When they come back inside and we're able to get them out of their suits. Uh, this is in the shuttle and we're just sharing a meal with the space station astronauts and other nights we would go over to the space station and uh, and eat around their table. This is my crewmate Rex Walheim showing off for his two little boys during a family video conference. Uh, another crewmate Steve Smith showing what happens when you let um, water um, free in the cabin and of course surface te tension takes over and, and it forms a ball. So after the week, we completed all of our spacewalks and we were uh, getting ready to undock. So of course we closed hatches, uh, making sure we had the right number of people on each side of the hatch. And then um, the commander and the pilot and I got ready for the uh, undock and that's our pilot, Steve Frick. And our job then was to undock and move um, 400 feet away wait for sunrise, and then do a complete fly around of the station where we would take photos um, to be used on future missions. So he here we are 400 feet away. Here's sunrise, happens really quickly when you're orbiting every hour and a half. And, uh, and then uh, Steve starts into the fly around here on the aft flight deck of the shuttle. And now here's what we look like from the station. You can see the payload bay is empty except for uh, the docking mechanism. And when we were halfway around, uh, this is what the station looked like to us. You can see the one big solo right there. Um, and inside, again, people are taking photos using the laser ranging device. And this was really the last good view that we had of the station. Um, before we did a burn, moved much further away and then um, started to prepare for re-entry. We spent a whole day checking out shuttle systems that you need for re-entry. And then this is the final morning of the flight where we're closing the payload bay doors. 
Um, and then we're also getting into these special suits, uh, which we use for launch and landing, and which can help protect us in certain kinds of movement. So then we um, went through the atmosphere, which is an exciting experience given how hot um, the outer portion of the shuttle uh, heats up. But now we're on the very final part of re-entry. I don't know if you can read the heads up display, but it shows we're going 290 knots and we're passing through 12,000 feet. And now you can see the runway that we're headed for. We look a lot like an airliner, but um, of course we have no engines running. Um, we're just a glider and a glider with very little lift. So we're actually dropping um, kind of like a rock. And uh, of course we have one opportunity to land. And so the trick is uh, to land at the right spot at the right speed. And about 300 feet above the ground, we start to gear down and then line up on the runway. And when we actually touch down, we're going um, much faster than a commercial airline, so over 200 knots. And uh, so we do deploy this uh, drag chute, which um, helps us have a safe uh, rollout on this a long run. And so that marked the end of this 11-day mission, STS-110, uh, where we started to build out this trust structure. And what I'd like to show you now is uh, what the station looks like today and what they're doing um, on board the space station. So this is actual video of the station. You can see how, how much it grew after our flight. Um, again, about a million pounds of hardware. And um, of course, it's what it is, is a laboratory in space. And uh, some of what they do is very fundamental research. This is a experiment called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer that studies dark matter and dark energy um, in the universe, so fundamental physics. And then inside the US laboratory, we have all different kinds of um, facilities. Uh, and so you can do many, many different kinds of, of research inside there. This is Peggy Whitson uh, working on a stem cell uh, project uh, where they were actually turning stem cells into heart muscle cells. And you can see here and in the next view, uh, a view of them actually beating together, um, even though they didn't start out as heart muscle cells. This is astronaut Kate Rubin Rubens. She was the first one to sequence DNA on orbit. That was a few years ago, but she's actually back on station now, launched in October. Um, and getting another opportunity for uh, six more months of doing science. So you can imagine how important it is to, uh, to be able to sequence DNA for long duration flights. Here's astronaut Chell Lindgren doing um, combustion research. This is what a flame looks like in microgravity, quite a bit different than on Earth. And also it combusts at two different temperatures, one of which is quite a bit cooler than what you would expect to see um, on Earth. Here's Scott Kelly with a freezer that we have, and um, that they collect mainly biological samples uh, until they're ready to be sent back to Earth. Uh, astronaut Joe Acaba doing a fluid flow experiment, um, important for understanding, for example, how to feed fuel to engines for satellites. A lot of the research is, is um, applied, and um, this is an experiment called SPHERES, which has led to um, another experiment on board called Astro B, which is really kind of an astronaut assistant um, that can fly around independently inside the International Space Station. Um, here's our very first 3D printer. Uh, I think we're on uh, the fifth generation now, but this was the very first tool that was uh, that was made on orbit. And as I mentioned, some of the uh, experiments are on the outside. This one's measuring wind direction and speed. Um, on the surface of the ocean, which helps with weather forecasting. We also can use the station to deploy um, small satellites and CubeSats, and probably have deployed well over 200 of those um, from all different kinds of customers, including universities. And of course, NASA is a customer in terms of trying to understand more about deep space exploration. And this is a expandable module um, developed by Bigelow Aerospace, but built on technology um, that was developed at Johnson Space Center. And it's been attached to the station about four years now. Uh, we've grown quite a bit of uh, different kinds of plants, uh, several kinds of lettuce uh, here you see here and 
in the news just this week, um, they harvested some radishes on board. The astronauts are part of many experiments because we're trying to learn more about human health and performance in space. They'll spend a, up to a couple hours a day exercising and of course also provide all kinds of samples and um, participate in a lot of other medical monitoring. This is Scott Kelly, who spent almost a year in space, 340 days total, along with um, cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko. And uh, there he is in the, in the cupola, which uh, provides some amazing views of Earth. All the astronauts participate in educational activities. Uh, and this is Joe Caba just um, doing one of these downlinks from inside the station. And here's some views uh, out the windows, which of course astronauts love to look at, but also their photographs and a lot of the video that is taken is also used by scientists. And I well remember um, being asked as a shuttle crew member to take photographs of specific areas that scientists uh, were, were in the middle of studying. Now, one of the things we have to look at is uh, how we resupply the station and how we get our astronauts to and from. Um, so we do have two U.S. companies that send up uh, cargo vehicles, the SpaceX Dragon and the Northrop Grumman uh, Cygnus, both of which you see here. A third company working on a cargo vehicle is Sierra Nevada with the Stream Chaser, so that's a simulation. And then we also have two companies uh, for crew transport. This is a simulation of the Boeing Starliner, and they hope to have a test flight to station with astronauts in 2021. And then, of course, the big news this year was that the SpaceX flew their Crew Dragon with NASA astronauts to the, inter, uh, to the uh, space station. Um, they had a test flight with two astronauts this summer and stayed two months. And then just a, a couple of weeks ago, they sent up four astronauts three from NASA, one from Japan, um, to spend six months on station. And now we're looking at beyond low Earth orbit. Um, this is uh, the Orion vehicle that uh, Dave Bowles was telling you about, which is being developed um, at Johnson Space Center, along with Lockheed Martin, and of course, with the support of many partners, including other NASA uh, facilities. So we're hoping for a first test flight of that with um, a new rocket being developed in uh, end of next year, about a year from now. So you can uh, stop sharing the screen now and I'm gonna talk a little bit more before we uh, get to the question and answer period. Uh, Cause I just wanted to talk a little bit more about um, some of the things that we I did after flying. Oh, I also did wanna mention that um, you can see the International Space Station fly over. And if you wanna find out times and where to look, you just, uh, search uh, on your computer, spot the station and put in your city. And I noticed there's some good ones in Norfolk next week, um, a particularly good one on December 9th um, at 5.48 p.m. So you might wanna look for that and uh, see the station flying over. So after my four flights, I had the opportunity to uh, go into a variety of management positions at Johnson Space Center um, culminating in becoming the center director at Johnson Space Center. And really a center director kind of has two main roles, uh, accomplish the mission and take care of your people. Um, and accomplish the mission means not just today's mission, but tomorrow's mission. So, you know, making sure you're hiring people with skills that we're gonna need five or 10 or 20 years from now, not just the ones that we have needed in the past, um, same way with facilities. And taking care of your people means a whole variety of things, including looking out for their health and safety and training and development, but really with a big focus also on inclusion and innovation. And we had a program at Johnson Spacer that really linked the two because it, um, anybody can have good ideas and can contribute to the cha challenges that we need to solve, but they have to feel respected and valued at work in order for them to feel comfortable speaking up and feel that they will be listened to. And that's why we felt it was so important to uh, focus on inclusion. Uh, we knew that was the best way to solve our uh, challenges. 
and also to keep our astronauts safe and the International Space Station and, and other spacecraft um, uh, productive and working safely. Um, we did uh, form employee resource groups at Johnson Space Center a number of years ago. And, and while I was center director, we actually grew the number. So there was, there's now nine, um, including a Hispanic group that draws on the experiences of uh, our folks at Johnson Space Center with some kind of Hispanic heritage. And they helped us in recruiting and onboarding activities and really came up with a lot of good ideas. For example, um, when we had leaders from the Mexican Space Agency come, um, they acted as translators and they ended up participating in science fairs in Mexico City. And then one of the ideas they had was our space station program puts out a two minute video every week called Space to Ground. And it just um, shows you what, what went on on the space station um, over the last week. And our Hispanic group said, well, we should really translate that into Spanish so we can reach an even wider audience. So um, they started doing that as a kind of as a pilot program called Espacio a Tierra. And uh, the space station program um, ended up continuing to fund it. And to this day, um, you can see both versions every week. So that might be something else that you wanna look for if you wanna uh, follow along with what's going on in space. And then finally, I just wanted to mention a few educational opportunities that NASA provides. Um, we have a program called Aerospace Scholars in several states, actually started in Texas, supported by Johnson Space Center. But um, Virginia has a program called the Aerospace uh, Science and Technology Scholars as well. And again, that's for high school students. And then we have community college aerospace scholars and internships for college students. And many universities and high schools have been involved with experiments both outside and inside the International Space Station. Um, we have middle school students that take Earth photos with the EarthCan camera on board. And there was even an elementary school that developed a CubeSat, which was launched from the International Space Station. I think these opportunities not only give some insight into science and engineering for students you know, early enough for them to, to think about what they might wanna do as a career, but it also shows the value of teamwork, of inclusion, and of other leadership skills like negotiating and collaborating and, and communicating. And I think those are all really important uh, for people as they go forward. I feel really fortunate to have had the opportunity to work for an organization that understands that it takes a talented, passionate, and diverse team to accomplish difficult activities. And fortunate that I got to be part of that team um, in the great adventure of space exploration for 30 years. So thank you for having me today. And we're gonna move on to the question and answer portion of, the, of today's program. Thank you, Dr. Ochoa for your insights on the STEM career that launched you into space. Yours is truly an inspiring story. And um, now we will take questions from our live audience. And to our audience, I wanna remind you that you may continue to submit your questions into the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Mine is at the bottom of the screen. And for some of you, it's at the top. And we will answer as many of your questions as time allows. Um, the first question we have comes from um, Anish Aradhi. And he would like to know, what were your interests in high school? Well, I um, probably the thing that I spent most of the time on, uh, particularly after school, was music because I was in the marching band, I was in the concert band and the orchestra, and then I ended up playing in the Civic Youth Orchestra of San Diego. So, um, so that was a big part of my life. Um, as I mentioned, I, I ended up taking all the math that was offered, which included essentially what would be the first um, semester of college calculus. Um, I really liked my literature classes and, um, you know, those were the things that um, kind of formed the highlight of, of high school for me. And along those lines, Adria Patrice Lewis would like to know, she thanks you, first of all, for speaking today. And she says that her dream is to become an astronaut. And she's curious about what inspired you to become an astronaut. Well, hopefully I kind of went through that um, in, the, in my talk, but uh, again, it was the opportunity to, um, to do research in space and to really just be part of this uh, human space exploration program, something you know, bigger than myself that really produced benefits for people here on earth. 
And along those lines, we have someone, when you're talking about research, we have someone who's interested in learning, if you had a blank check to do research, what would you do? <laughs> well, gosh, I don't know. You know, um, back when I was uh, actually an active researcher, my, um, my field was optical information processing. So using optical components like lasers, um, materials that could do real, uh, real-time holography lenses to extract information from images. So, so that's kind of what my history was in, but I get the opportunity now um, as part of the National Science Board to hear about all different kinds of research in many different fields. And, um, you know, there's always something there that interests me. So I don't know what I would do myself, but I really enjoy the role I have now where I get kind of a broader view across many different fields. And in preparing to be an astronaut or to do research, what are some types of backgrounds that you recommend? I know that you're recommending that all students take as many math and science courses as they can, but um, what additional preparation do you recommend for students that are particular majors or particular classes in addition to science and math that you recommend they take? Uh, well, if you look at the astronaut core, you'll see that there's a whole variety of different majors um, that are represented. I mean, of course, they're all somehow in the STEM fields, but many different kinds of both science and engineering as, as well as medicine. Um, so there's no one particular one that, um, uh, you know, what a person should take. It really should be what you're most interested in. Because what makes it more likely for you to be selected is that you have somehow stood out from the crowd. And that's going to happen if you're working on something that you are really interested in and passionate about and working hard at. Thank you for that. Um, I know that you mentioned in your, when we were watching your video, you mentioned Mike Bloomfield, who apparently was in space with you. Mike Bloomfield is actually an ODU alumnus, and his major <laughs> was engineering for those, you know, wondering. Wonderful what you study when you become, um, to become an astronaut. But like you said, you know, there's chemists, there's many, many different um, majors that students can pursue to, to be in space. Um, we have a question from a fourth grader, Nina, and she would like to know when you are in space, would you see the moon up close and is the sun bigger than from earth? So when we're uh, orbiting around the earth, um, most of my flights were um, anywhere between, say, 160 to 220 miles above the surface of the Earth. So we're not really closer to the moon or the sun. <laughs> you know, I mean, the moon's um, a quarter of a million miles away. The sun's 90 million miles away. So, um, the, you know, it's, it's a negligible difference that we're closer. But we are above the Earth's atmosphere. So what happens is we can see it much more clearly. Um, obviously you wouldn't look right at the sun, but we do look at the moon. Um, you can see it much more clearly. We have a, a nice pair of um, gyro stabilized binoculars that we can look to get a, a really good view or some of the camera lenses that we have. And of course, um, on the night side of the earth, you can see many, many more stars than you can see on the surface of the earth, just because um, you don't have to look through the atmosphere. That must have been an incredible sight. Absolutely. We have Emma Good asking, um, she's asking, what surprised you the most when you were in space? Well, gosh, it's, it's hard to say. Um, first of all, you know, obviously um, the people that I flew for the, when I flew for the first time, there were other people on my crew that had already flown in space. And so a lot of during training is they're letting you know what to expect. And we, we hear debriefs from all the crews that come back. So hopefully nothing totally surprises you because you want to be prepared for what it's going to be like. But still, there's no way you can really get that experience. I mean, looking out the window, even though we would see photographs of the earth that people took, I mean, it was just so much more vivid um, when you're up there looking out yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, living and working in microgravity, um, again, we don't, we, there's no way to simulate that on earth. We are able to fly in an aircraft where you get about 25 seconds of um, zero gravity at a time, but obviously that doesn't give you the feel for what it's really going to be like to be floating the whole time you're in space. So it, it's kind of just um, on the job training. And while you were in space, we have some students that are curious to learn what types of food you ate. 
Oh, well, we, we have a pretty wide variety and it's actually gotten, um, I would say much wider variety um, in the space station era because we ended up incorporating more international foods. Um, there's a Japanese astronaut on board right now and, and they were showing at Thanksgiving that he had brought some curry that they were enjoying along with some of the turkey and, and dressing that they had on board. Um, but we had, uh, you know, all, the food is either um, thermostabilized, so kind of like packaged uh, the way military food is packaged, or it's freeze dried. And so uh, a, a lot of our food, we need to add water to it um, and then maybe heat it, maybe not, it depends. So we have all kinds of chicken dishes. Um, you know, we, uh, we do bring up um, tortillas because you don't want to have bread in space. Um, all the little crumbs would just float all around the cabin and you might get something in your eye or inhale it. Um, so tortilla work, tortillas work out to be a great substitute for sandwiches or even breakfast burritos. Um, they have a good macaroni and cheese, which uh, I thought was good comfort food <laughs> on orbit, but just a, a wide variety of things. Mac and cheese is also great comfort food on earth. But yes, Absolutely. <laughs> especially at Thanksgiving, right? Um, we have a question from Andy Casiello. He would like to know what was the biggest surprise to you in the entire shuttle trip? The feeling of the launch, seeing the earth, the ISS itself, re-entry. Um, thank you so much for your talk. It has been very inspiring. Okay, um, well, let's see. I guess I'll talk about one thing on my first launch. Um, so I mentioned there's quite a bit of vibration um, in the first two minutes of launch when the solid rocket boosters are firing and it builds up to about three Gs. So that means that it feels like somebody that weighs three times as much as you is sitting on your chest. Um, and so you can really feel that acceleration. And then when the solid rocket boosters um, separate away from the rest of the uh, shuttle, you're back down to just about one G. And um, the liquid engines run much more smoothly. So all the vibration goes away. So what it felt like to me was that we'd stopped because <laughs> I couldn't feel any acceleration. I couldn't feel any vibration. And, um, and I just remember thinking like, that cannot be good. But um, in fact, uh, fortunately I was on the flight deck. I could look and see the instruments and could see that the, you know, the um, altitude was continuing to click up and as, as well as our um, speed. And, um, and then of course there's um, various calls from mission control that let you know. But I remember there was just like this two or three seconds where it felt like we had stopped and, and that did surprise me. Thanks for sharing that. Our next question comes from Dr. Sarah Rutledge who is joining us from Mount Aloysius College in Indiana, Pennsylvania. And she says, dear Dr. Ochoa, as a teacher educator, I'm constantly looking for resources to share with my college students to assist in preparing them to be great teachers of K through 12 space science. Do you have any favorite go-to web resources for pre-service teachers and professors? Thank you for your wonderful presentation and exceptional video. Well, um, both NASA and the NAS National Science Foundation um, have a lot of resources for teachers. And I would say in particular NASA, you can go on and you can select the grade levels that you're interested in. And they've been um, really putting out a lot of things this year because they know um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of students are, are of course at home. And so they're trying to help out both teachers and parents with, you know, what are things you actually have around the house, but which you can use to, um, to learn more about um, science um, activities, um, different kinds of principles and things like that. So there's quite a bit on the NASA site. And then it, if you also go to on the National Science Foundation site, NSF.gov, um, you'll find some resources as well for, uh, for students and teachers. Great. And along the theme of preparation and training, can you talk through the training that um, astronauts must undergo um, as part of the space program um, after you receive your bachelor's degree in college? Uh, so you mean after I was selected for the program? Yeah, so I, I, I talked a little bit of that in my talk where um, a lot of it was kind of studying and learning about the shuttle systems. And then there was um, operational training um, in high performance aircraft and uh, other kinds of things. So, um, and then sort of once you get 
beyond sort of the basics of learning about the shuttle systems, they kind of put all the systems together um, and start inserting malfunctions so that you have to figure out what's wrong, what went down. Maybe there was an electrical bus that went down or one of the computers stopped working and you have to learn how to work your way through that. Um, and then um, also there's more specialized training. So for example, I mentioned I was the robotic arm operator. I actually did that on all four of my flights. So I had specific training for that. Um, and then um, there's also specific training for people who are doing spacewalks. And as I mentioned, a lot of that occurs underwater, a big pool uh, that we have at Johnson Space Center. And then the astronauts who are going to land the shuttle at the end of a mission, um, they have specific training for that. And we had um, some aircraft that were um, modified in order to make handling it more like handling the shuttle at the end of the mission. And other people want to know what was your favorite part of being an astronaut once you were selected? <laughs> oh, I don't think I can pick just one thing. <laughs> I, I pretty much liked everything about it. You know, obviously uh, the experience in space, um, but also uh, I, I really enjoyed the training because I thought it was um, intellectually um, challenging, um, but also learning to, to work together as a, a crew. And then of course um, ended up giving you know hundreds of talks to schools all around the country during the time I was at NASA as well. And can you tell us what are some ways that we can help increase the representation of Latinos one day in the near future in space so they can follow in your footsteps? Well I, I hope this is one way. <laughs> you know um, just letting people know about kind uh, careers that exist in science, technology, engineering, and math um, and um, hoping that people have access to you know either people who are in, who will encourage them or you know some other way particularly in the middle school age of giving people some kinds of hands-on activities that allow them to um, either do science experiments or get together on you know in a project-based um, kind of setting you know those were things that I really didn't have at that age and I think that's why it took me a long time to even think about um, science because I just I didn't really know what it was and just like a lot of other people I didn't picture people like me doing it um, but you know, it's really about being able to use your curiosity and your creativity, and in most cases, working together as a team. And I think those are things that appeal to a lot of people. Um, and it's solving problems. It can be problems that affect your community and the people that you care about. And, and really that's what um, science and engineering does. So I, I certainly hope we can encourage more um, Latinos and Latinas to, to go into STEM. And um, since you just mentioned that at first, you didn't think that, you know, it could be you one day. Um, I know that some of the women who are attending our talk today are actually asking questions regarding the imposter syndrome. And so that feeling that even after you accomplish it, that, you know, maybe you shouldn't have been there or you don't feel like you've arrived. Um, have, they want to know a personal question if you've ever suffered from imposter syndrome. And if you have, how would you deal with it? Well, I guess there were times um, when I wondered, uh, you know, how well I would be able to do it something. I can remember going off to Stanford as a grad student and, um, you know, my roommate was from MIT and the guys across the hall were from Caltech and I was from San Diego State and I had gotten into science and engineering pretty late and I just wondered, well, I, I, I don't know if I can, you know, keep up or can compete, but you know, I just did the same thing I always do, which is like, I'm going to work hard, you know, I'm going to do the best that I can. Um, I, uh, you know, I would go to professor's office hours and just sort of try to work through it step by step. I think it's important not to talk yourself out of something, right? <laughs> I mean, um, you know, you should just go for it and realize that, um, you know, people who have the same kind of attributes as you, they may not look like you, um, they may have grown up differently, but the things that are important are working hard and, um, you know, wanting to do well. And if you're working as part of a team, you know, really uh, wanting to help the team uh, develop uh, what they need to develop. 
and and then just try not to get kind of psyched out about uh, questions I think almost everybody has. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, I'm the only one that feels this way that wonders if I can actually make it. Whereas, as it turns out, um, most people, at least at some point or another, feel that way as well. We appreciate you sharing that. I know that it's going to help me and many others that are watching today. Thank you. And we just have time for one final question. And that is, if you have any words for high school or college students that have a dream of going to space as an astronaut, what would be some final words to them? Well, I mentioned some of the educational opportunities and certainly for college students, um, NASA has internship programs, um, particularly the Pathways Internship Program. And that's how we actually hire, end up hiring a lot of our employees or people that have been through that program. And then, you know, in addition to um, uh, studying STEM, you know, other things that are important for the astronaut program are, um, you know, being a good team member and being a good leader. And not everybody's good at both, right? <laughs> And so there are activities you can do where you can, um, you know, work on teamwork skills. You can do that in high school. You might be on a sports team or like me, I was a member of musical groups. Um, uh, you know, other people do other activities, but realize that those are things that can pre prepare you uh, as well. Thank you. And like you said, one of the most important things we can do is not talk ourselves out of something before we've done it. Just yeah, read absolutely. Advice. Well, thank you again for a wonderful and inspiring talk. Um, on behalf of President John R. Broderick, Old Dominion Universities and the Reyes Program Planning Team, I would like to thank you for uh, one more time for joining us today. Um, we will continue to follow your inspiring story. And for those of you that are interested in following with us, you can follow Dr. Ochoa at astro underscore Ellen. Again, astro underscore Ellen. And uh, Dr. Ochoa, following you on Twitter, I also learned that you're a fan of American football. <laughs> and so <laughs> as a small token of our appreciation, we are gifting you with an ODU stadium blanket, which we oh. will, uh, we hope will remind you of our friends of uh, your friends at ODU. Um, so please join me in thanking Dr. Ochoa with a, virtu a large virtual applause. Um, I'd like to also extend my gratitude to the Office of Strategic Communication and Marketing, the Office of Distance Learning, and the Office of Community Engagement for their support of this event. Um, to our audience, thank you for tuning in. Uh, for more information about upcoming Regis lectures, visit odu.edu slash Regis. And next spring, we will be exploring telehealth, physics, which as you know, Dr. Ochoa studied wind energy, and many more subjects. So we look forward to you joining us. And today's session has been recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again, or if you want to share it with friends, you can access it from the Reyes website at odu.edu slash This concludes today's program. Please have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.